We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. G'day and welcome back to Space Junk Podcast, the co-video edition. And today I am talking about Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty with the coolest space lawyer, Professor Mariba Jart. Mariba, how are you? I'm doing fairly well, uh, you know, as, as all things can be here in Austin, Texas. I think uh, everybody in the world is, is somewhat on lockdown. So w- within those confines, doing it as, as best as possible. Thank you. How about yourself? Oh, look, I'm, I'm doing absolutely well. I mean, you know, in Australia, everyone's been buying toilet paper, but I've still got a role. So this is my backup role. Um, there you so go. Until, until that goes, I think I, I have nothing to complain about. Things are as good as they can be for me. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, no, it is, it is good. And I wanted to ask you, obviously, uh, you and I know each other, and Mariba was featured in an episode of Space Junk Podcast not too long ago. So if you haven't heard it, I would very much encourage that after you watch this, you go and listen, because it's a much more in-depth conversation with Mariba about um, his philosophy on things. But Mariba, I wanted to ask you to just briefly introduce yourself for listeners or viewers who haven't um, yet had the privilege of making your acquaintance. No, thank, thank you so much. So um, honored to be here. And I guess, you know, for me, I could kind of describe myself as a space environmentalist. So I'm very much concerned about the long-term sustainability of the space environment, especially around Earth, where we put these satellites that provide critical services and, and capabilities that we depend upon every day. And my background is in this thing called astrodynamics, which is the science that studies how things move Uh, and behave in space. And, you know, the thing that really got me kind of locked into wanting to do this sort of thing or explore it was uh, when I was much younger, I was enlisted in the the U.S. Air Force. And my job was uh, as a security guard at uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. I had no idea where this base was until they told me I had to go there, had to look it up on a map at the time. And anyway, this place is called you know Big Sky Country. That's how it's known. Uh, Montana is called Big Sky Country, and it has a lot of sky. And during my evenings, when I used to guard the uh, uh, nuclear missile uh, silos, I'd look up at the sky. And if you've never seen a sky uh, that's very dark, so you can see all the stars, it's an amazing experience for sure. See the Milky Way and all these things, and I could see dots of light moving across the sky. And I wondered, I, you know, what are these things? Are these things planes? Well, clearly no, I, I, don't, I don't see the blinking lights, that sort of stuff. Definitely moving way too slow to be, you know, meteors, because I, I, I've seen plenty of those, you know, shooting stars. And then in, in really doing my research, I figured, wow, these things are human-made objects orbiting the planet. And I can see these things with my, my naked eye. It's like, what are these things? What are they doing up there? What's their purpose? Who's controlling them? And that really got me more and more uh, interested in, in really understanding this population of, of human-made objects orbiting the planet. I think that that's, um, I mean, the way that you became interested in space law through that kind of fascination with these objects, but then also the environmental lens is incredibly important. And I think that it's very good for people who are watching this or listening to this to remember that space law is not just something that's done in the rooms of the UN or, or in, you know, boring offices around the world. It's something that is very much linked to our interaction with space. And more importantly, I think, with our interactions with each other in the environment in which we live. And it's fundamentally questions about how we ought to behave towards each other, I think. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and I'll say this. I think one of the things that really underscored the importance of looking at the law and policy side of things is, and we're going to discuss some of this, so I won't uh, you know, steal your thunder, but I'll say that having participated at the United Nations level in some of these kind of diplomatic uh, engagements, even when people agree to 
a, a corpus of, of things that people say we're going to abide by these, the interpretation is quite varied amongst different countries because we all, you know, grew up in different cultures with different beliefs. And all of these things tend to be a lens through which we perceive uh, even common, common nomenclature and co common semantics. So it's, it's very critical, very important stuff. And with that, I think we should get to Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, Mariba, Article 6 is, I think, one of the most important articles. And I think maybe at the time it was written, in the context of everything else, it was maybe less important. Article 4 about nuclear weapons in space was kind of key. But now I think Article 6 is really coming into its own. So I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then we will discuss. Um, at some length, I hope. Excellent. So, Article 6. States parties to the treaty shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and for assuring that national activities are carried out in conformity with the provisions set forth in the present treaty. The activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. When activities are carried on in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, by an international organization, responsibility for compliance with this treaty shall be borne both by the international organization and by the state's parties to the treaty participating in such organization. So, Mariba, that's a lot of words. What does that all boil down to? Yeah, so I think, you know, for me, my, my uh, broad brushstroke interpretation is that right now, put it this way, when, when things started uh, in outer space, it was mostly countries, state actors that were participating, namely the U.S., China, and, and the Soviet Union at the time. And it was mostly governmental activities. And outer space, near Earth outer space, certainly was this kind of pristine environment. Not much debris or any of, of these things. You go from the launch of Sputnik at the end of the 50s, Apollo program, these sorts of things, a few of these objects in space, maybe you know, 10 or 12, that sort of thing. And now there's over 26,000 uh, human-made objects ranging in size from your cell phone all the way to the space station that are being tracked. And it's not just those three kind of countries that, that I mentioned. Now, the United Nations recognizes upwards of, of 93, 96 uh, spacefaring nations. And there's a new gold rush going on. And that is not led by governments, but mostly by industry. And so space commerce is now kind of booming, bo you know, booming thriving. You have SpaceX that wants global internet. Elon Musk is launching 60 satellites every few weeks that we've seen in use with the Starlinks. OneWeb is, is, uh, has several satellites up there already. They want to send up uh, several hundred for sure. And you even have uh, Project Kuiper with Amazon. Jeff Bezos, he wants in on this game of global internet. And you see more and more companies doing this. So, you know, coming back to Article 6, what strikes me as extremely uh, particular about it is that Basically, the countries are bearing full responsibility over the behavior and the activities of all these companies. So it, pretty much it says it doesn't have to be this governmental kind of thing. Basically, you know, any kind of citizen or, or what have you of this country uh, acting in space, basically the country takes responsibility over these activities being in line with this outer space treaty. And this notion of continuous monitoring, which I would say nobody does that. Nobody continuously monitors stuff in space. Mm. Loosely speaking, people could say, oh, well, you know, continuous monitoring means that I get to it as often as I can. Well, I don't interpret it that way. To me, continuous, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the formal definition of that, which is all the time. And nobody watches stuff in space all the time. So it becomes quite tricky uh, when it comes to are people actually implementing and adhering to 
Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty? And I would say, by and large, the answer is no. So, in essence, then, Article 6 says that if you're a company, any company doing something in space, that responsibility for what you do in space rests with the national government that is responsible for you. And that could be because you're a citizen of that country. It could be because your company is registered to that country or carries out activities in that country. That's right. I don't know. My own understanding of this is that this is written down in Article 6, but I don't think that very many people have actually read Article 6 because this is one of the most common misconceptions, I think, about international space law. This idea that companies are not bound by it, that somehow, um, you know, it's just for national activities, it's just for states and for national governmental activities like NASA or the, the you know, the Roscosmos. It's got nothing to do with Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, right, um, right. Richard Branson. And that's just untrue. I mean, the words make it incredibly clear that it's the responsibility <laughs> of the national governments to monitor, and as you say, um, authorization and continuing supervision, and to hold that responsibility. And I, I think that if, the, if national governments understood the extent to which they have that responsibility, and the extent to which they're meant to be carrying out that activity, they would just be blown away and, um, and they would realize just how little they're currently doing. And I, I'm kind of astonished by the fact that no one knows this. Uh, do you, is this yeah, something yeah. where governments are just turning their back on regulation because, you know, politically and economically, that's what we do in other areas. So we just have that light touch approach and they just don't get that they're still responsible. Like, what's your take on this? So, so, um, yeah, I have, I, I have, a, my take is varied. Some of it is a bit, uh, you know, cynical even. And um, I'll say this. Um, I think that at the end of the day, uh, people might interpret it loosely the way I did, but they're like, okay, if something happens, who's going to prosecute? Where does that happen? And I'll put it even a, a bit further. And this is part of what I call the the chicken and egg effect of space situational awareness. Um, so, so for the viewers, this idea of space situational awareness is just decision-making knowledge in space. Anytime you wanna make some decision about something in space, whether or not I should launch now or later, I wanna avoid some hazard, I wanna figure out you know, where I should move my satellite and when, that knowledge that would enable me to make you know, an informed decision, that's what we loosely call space situational awareness. And, one of the, the flaws of current space situational awareness is that oftentimes multiple beliefs or hypotheses explain the same body of evidence. And what I mean by that is we see, uh, you know, time and time again, anomalies happening to satellites. And then the reason for the anomaly is fairly ambiguous, meaning, okay, um, my satellite seems to have stopped working last night at eight o'clock in the evening. Why, why, why did that happen? Well, was it because the, the sun had a hiccup of energy and that disrupted my electronics? Was it because a micro meteoroid uh, hit the satellite at just the right place at the right time and disrupted something? Did a piece of human made space garbage uh, collide with my satellite and do something? Was it my competitor that purposefully snuck up to me and did something malicious to me even? Uh, so typically, all of these things that I just enumerated explain the same evidence of satellite had an anomaly, and we, we can't really uh, reconcile one-to-one -one causal relationships. And even though the world uh, as a whole recognizes that it's not good, that there's this much ambiguity, and that we should thrive to come up with these one-to-one -one causal relationships uh, beyond any sort of reasonable doubt, at the same time, if people don't move in that direction, I think you can kind of start seeing it gives a lot of latitude to how this Article 6 could not only just be interpreted, but actually uh, somebody could, could raise some dispute, right? Because countries can say, well, uh, as long as everybody doesn't really know where everything is all the time and all this other stuff, 
I'm kind of free to do what I want. I kind of can relax a little bit in terms of how much monitoring and how much oversight I need to provide to people who launch from my country or register my company, all these other things. And if somebody raises a dispute, which it's going to happen, it's not a matter of if, but when, with more and more companies, something's going to happen where somebody's going to get upset and they're going to say, yep, Jimmy did this to me. I, I, I know it. Okay. Well, what's the body of evidence that that actually happened? And that's very hard to come by these days because um, evidence can be refuted. So I think that uh, our knowledge about stuff in space is ambiguous and nebulous, even though people realize that a safer space means knowing more about stuff and retiring ignorance. Um, there's a responsibility that's going to come along with retiring ignorance because when you know where everything is at and there, there's clear evidence of one-to-one -one causal relationships, people are going to start leaning a little bit more, I think, on these articles in the Outer Space Treaty, and you're going to see disputes show up. How do you think that will affect companies like SpaceX that have these huge plans? I mean, like the Starlink network, we're talking an astonishing number of small satellites, um, which, you know, managing that and ensuring that something doesn't go wrong is, is incredibly difficult. Yeah, so I think that the way it'll affect companies is um, it means that there's going to be an extra burden of being transparent, uh, an extra burden of making yourself as predictable as possible to help people plan to avoid any sort of hazards, or even uh, let's go beyond hazards. Um, let's, let's go to misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. Misinterpretations are happening all the time in space. You go to spacenews.com, oh, you know, uh, here's this USA satellite and the Russians are like sneaking up to it, even though sneaking up means like, you know, over a hundred kilometers away. Oh, the Russians are sneaking up to this sort of thing. Or, oh, you know, here's this Chinese satellite and here's this other country and their satellite is like, you know, part close or it's behaving this way or that way. You know, the first thing that people assume is that there's, you know, evil is afoot, uh, nefarious activity. Mm. And they don't necessarily take into account cultural uh, signals and tendencies. And I don't know, let me give you an example, something more benign. I'm a US satellite. I uh, have many, many sensors to figure out where my satellite is very precisely, very accurately. And all of a sudden, here's this other satellite that, I don't know, uh, not to pick on them, but let's say it's an Ethiopian satellite. Or let's say Venezuela. Venezuela, they just had uh, one of their geo birds apparently just uh, they lost control of it just uh, you know yesterday or something like that. So let's say that here's this Venezuelan satellite, and from my perspective, it's behaving erratically. The way they're moving it, from my perspective, it's like wow, like that's crazy. Like you know who's who's joysticking this thing? Who's driving it? Like it's very erratic. But the thing is, Venezuela doesn't have a global network of sensors to track and monitor all this stuff. Even though they launched, there's no way that Venezuela, for instance, could could uh, apply continuous supervision uh, uh, of anything they launch because as soon as it drifts a little bit too much to the east or west, they don't have sensors to be able to do that. They have to rely on somebody like the United States with the Space Surveillance Network. Many mm. countries, in fact, have to rely on the data that comes from uh, the 18th Space uh, 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 you know, Squadron that, that develops this catalog. And so um, the fact that these people don't have that level of you know, sensors and all that means they can't control their satellite to as good as we do, for instance. And so it's not that they're purposely trying to be uh, erratic or, or um, disruptive or, or, or not behave in a way that, that's appropriate. They're doing the best that they can. So at, at some point, you have people saying best practices in space and you need to be able to, you know, know where your satellite is to within two meters. Well, that eliminates a bunch of people on the planet because they don't have the wealth and the resources to be able to do that stuff. Right. So in that sense, I guess Article 6 is then less about, in this interpretation that we're discussing, less about saying that, you know, governments have to do all of the stuff and the private sector can't do things. It's more about saying that governments need to be across where things are, when they are, and continually monitor and supervise what's going on in space, particularly when it's done by private sector 
um, your participants because ultimately when something goes wrong, it is the government of whatever country who will phone up the government of the other country and say, hey, what are you doing? Is this some sort of thing I should be worried about? Is this an act of aggression or is this, you know, are you trying to snoop on us? And the government who picks up the phone at the other end needs to be able to say with confidence, no, we have been monitoring this satellite. It's gone out of control. It belongs to, you know, Annie's crazy space company and they're doing their best to solve it. And here is a bunch of data to prove that we don't need to go to war over this. So this is actually a way of avoiding conflict. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, um, right now we kind of speak about the three S's in near Earth space. We say we want space to be safe, secure, and sustainable. And in order to get to those things, in order for those things to be achieved, I would say you get there through transparency, predictability, and holding people accountable. And I feel that Article 6, uh, pretty much gives a lot of mandate to countries to say to industry, listen, I want you to be successful. I want you to create jobs. I want you to make profit and all these things. But I'm going to require you to, with me, be transparent. I'm not going to sell your, I'm not going to sell your uh, company secret sauce and that sort of stuff. I'm not going to violate your IP. Um, we can sign whatever non-disclosure agreements, all this stuff, right? Um, but I'm going to require you to be transparent. I'm going to require you to provide me as much information as possible so that I can predict how you're going to behave at any given point. And I'm going to ask you to provide me as much information that I can aggregate with my own to hold you accountable for how you behave up there because ultimately it's our responsibility as the government on how it is that you behave and adhere to all these sorts of things. Absolutely. Mm. I think that's a really important message and I hope that anyone watching this video or listening to this episode uh, who works in government in any country is aware of this article and aware of the responsibility that it puts on governments to not just regulate and supervise but support non-governmental entities in the private sector to succeed. And that's not just from, you know, the, the perspective of clearing licenses so they can launch as fast as possible. It's about ensuring that that success is sustainable. And the way to do that is open, you know, open transparency and knowledge about what's going on at all times. Absolutely. I think, look, I think that we have really covered that and I'm so happy we have because, um, this discussion has given me a new appreciation for Article 6 from a completely different angle than I had in mind. I think in my head, I've always looked at it as a kind of top-down government has to do things. But looking at it from this perspective, I see that this is also about um, our futures and about growing industry and doing so in a really safe way. So I thank you for that. Absolutely. If people would like to find out more about what you do or about you or anything else, um, how can they get in contact or where should they go to look up the things you've written? Yeah, so, so I think, uh, the, I mean, the easiest thing is to, you know, Google my name. I, I, you'll see a lot of things pop up. I have a TED Talk uh, that I would definitely encourage people to be able to watch. Um, uh, you know, more about utexas.edu is my email feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to uh, entertain a conversation, maybe a Zoom. Uh, these days we can't travel, uh, so, so I'm happy to do Zoom, Zoom uh, uh, exchanges as well. So yeah, I'm very much open and receptive and, and encourage people to, uh, to get a hold of me so we can talk about these things further. And during these times of COVID lockdown, is there anything you'd recommend that people watch or listen to or read that you've been enjoying or that you would recommend? <laughs> you know, I've been actually so busy trying to strategically work on my own research program and that sort of stuff. Uh, that's kind of been dominating, dominating my time between that and juggling the three-year-old and then teenagers that I have. Um, that's pretty much what I've been up to. So I, I, I'd be a poor recommender of something to watch or read, but I, I do want uh, very much so for people to Again, like look at my TED talk and I have a few podcasts out there, one with you and uh, I've done a few and, and uh, to please listen into those because uh, there's a lot more detail in there and uh, hopefully it spurs, uh, 
people asking themselves lots of questions and, and curiosity and wanting to pursue those curiosities. Great, thank you so much, Mariba. I will put a link to um, Mariba's TED Talk and also to the podcast episode that we did together um, in the description under this video. So check that out. And uh, yes, you heard it from Mariba. If you've got any thoughts or questions, you can reach out and um, Mariba has been very generous there. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to talk to you and good luck over the next um, you know, weeks and months. Likewise, Annie, it's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. I, I love, I love the hoodie and everything. It's uh, I think I want to, <laughs> I want to get myself one of those now for, for real. So you're going to have to offline. You're going to have to tell me where I can get one. I'll send you a link. Absolutely. Good. Good. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.